right. Welcome again to Discovery Church. Let me look at the camera. Welcome everyone. Join us online or wherever you're watching today. Come on, who's excited to be in God's house and hearing the Word of God? Amen. We are beginning today a brand new series. Don't know if you know it, but uh, you've enrolled in relationship rehab today. No, I'm just kidding. This is, this is what we're going to be doing for the next several weeks together. We're going to be going through some rehabilitation. I think, I really do think that this message today in this series really has a powerful opportunity to not only impact your life, but really change your life because your most important decisions are your relationship decisions. And I think a lot of them are in desperate need of repair. In fact, let me just ask the question. Is there any relationship in your life that needs repair? Let me just hear you. Let me just, come on. Is there any relationship in your life that needs some repair? I, I think all over the place. It's, I think it's just gotten worse, man. Like relationships, they're already hard as there is. You probably realize it's, it's really easy to break one, a relationship. It's really hard to repair a relationship though. And, and I think in this series, like we're going we're gonna to help you out in your relationships to see some rehab and some repair. Next Sunday, I'm actually tag team teaching. Me and Pastor Veronica will be sharing the Word of God together. We're going to share a word that we've called 12-step recovery for marriage. So, so uh, whether this is, for some of you, it's proactive, okay? It's a proactive word. You don't need it right now, but you need it, you'll need it later. So you need to come and hear me ready. For some of you, it's preventative. Maybe you don't need it right now. Your marriage is going great, but you need some preventative maintenance. And then others of you, it's like a present crisis. It's a present need in crisis situation. You need to have recovery in your marriage. And that'll be, that'll be where we're going next week. But today, I, I want to talk to you, kind of set the stage of our Relationship Rehab series, talk to you about relearning re friendship, to relearn what does it mean to be a friend. And I, I think that that we've allowed culture, society, maybe even social media to define for us what it means to be a friend. And if you're a child of God in this place, if you love Jesus, if you have faith, it, then this word, this Bible should actually be the standard of our life. What it means to be a friend should be reflected in the scriptures. And there are so many scriptures that actually have to do with friendship that I want to relearn. I want to relearn what does it mean to be a friend because we all have, I mean, feuding families and fractures and, 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 and challenges, but I think social media has been giving us this illusion of friendship and connection when in reality, like you might have a thousand friends, you got a thousand friends online, but you ain't got nobody to move your couch. You know what I'm talking about? Are they really your friend? See, one of the primary reasons why I think we don't have these meaningful relationships today is because we've insulated ourselves from rejection. We don't wanna put ourselves out there, that trust and that vulnerability, and then to be rejected. And so many people just don't have the resilience necessary for friendship anymore. Because we, we've isolated ourselves in these echo chambers with soft corners and Netflix tells me what to watch next and Instagram algorithms show me what I wanna see. And so our resilience, our ability to handle rejection is just not the same. And it's really at risk when you enter into relationship. And so the result is many people are living with loneliness. And at times it may not seem like you're lonely because you're, you're, you're in the know with a lot of people. You know a lot about people. But if you're honest in moments, you can feel the, the loneliness in your soul. Like you can feel that you're not connected. You can sense it. A recent study revealed that lo loneliness is at an all-time high in America. The Bible has a lot to say about loneliness. In the book of Genesis, God says it's not good that man would be alone. But this report says it won't just make you miserable. Loneliness will kill you. Like, like 30%, you're 30% more likely to die if you are lonely. It's more than a feeling. Your body, listen, your body and your mind begins to shut down when you don't have these meaningful connections. There was this book called uh, Project Unlonely by Jeremy Noble. And, and he identified three types of loneliness. And you could be experiencing any or all of these types of loneliness today. He said there's psychological, there's social, and there's spiritual or existential, he called it. The psychological loneliness is where you just don't uh, feel like you have anyone that you can confide in, in your life. There's no one I can really trust in my life. And there's this psychological loneliness with that. The social loneliness is where we don't feel like we belong. We don't feel like we fit in. 
We don't feel like there's anyone here, my, my people are here. And whether that's perceived or not, because a lot of times it is perceived and there's this fear of exposure or rejection that doesn't get us to step into the connections that are available to us. But it, whatever it is, whether it's perceived or real, whatever, it's, it is a feeling and it is loneliness, psychological, social. And then there's this spiritual loneliness that comes from feeling disconnected from yourself. That you don't know you and you feel disconnected from yourself. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26 says, a righteous person is cautious in friendships because the ways of evil people can lead them to do wrong. So, so we don't need all these, like, we don't need thousands of friends. We don't need thousands of people. And we don't need to know what thousands of people are doing in my life. I don't. I, can be, I need to be cautious about this. I need to be selective. I don't, know, I don't just arbitrarily let people into my life and get close to just any person. I got to be a little bit more selective. The reality is a lot of us aren't selective. Like, I'll say it like this, casual friends can be the result of your circumstances, but close friends should be the result of your choices. The sad truth is, while we have the option of choosing our friends, more often than not, our friendships are determined by circumstances, like where you work and who you work with, or who your relatives are, not by choice. And Jesus here is our ultimate example of, of what it means to be a friend and how he related to people in friendship. Jesus had healthy, and he was good. He was a good example of healthy boundaries in friendship. He made relationship by choice, not by circumstance. Jesus loved everybody. He preached to the thousands. He trained 120 people. The Word of God says he discipled 12, but he mentored three. Let me say that again. Jesus loved everybody. He preached to thousands. He trained 120. He discipled 12, the 12 apostles, but he only mentored three. Only three of them were, were allowed, brought into the most intimate, sacred space of Jesus' life. It was only those three. It was actually Peter, James, and John that he brought close. It was only them that got invited to, say, the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was transformed. The glory of God was radiating. He brought only Peter, James, and John to experience this beautiful, intimate moment. It was only these three, Peter, James, and John, that were invited into the moment of the Garden of Gethsemane, the moment of his greatest pain and, and hurt and betrayal and his tears and his sweat. It was only those three who got to see that moment. And, and you may hear this and go, well, wait a second, was Jesus playing favorites? Yes, he was. Jesus was. He was, here's what he was doing. He was giving the most time to the people who actually had the most responsibility and needed the most of him. He did not allow people in the crowd to monopolize his time and energy because he would not be faithful to the people God had called them to. Are y'all with me today? So some of us, we see these like these spheres of like boundaries and relationships. And some of us go to the extreme form and, 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 and you live in isolation. Like there's, there's this crowd part of you, but no one is actually in the, no one sees you sweat in the garden. No one sees you cry and shed a tear. You got no one to share that experience of your pain in your life. And so there's, there's this isolation that we're feeling. And then on the other extreme, others of you, you, you don't know how to say no to people. You say yes to everything and every party, and if you, you feel like you're not a good friend if you don't say yes, and if you don't show up, or if you don't respond back in a certain timeline, and, and that's, I'm not a good friend then. And you may even unmistakably convince yourself it's not the Christ-like thing to do. Like, that's what I'm supposed to do to be a good friend. When in reality, Jesus actually was a good model of healthy boundaries. Proverbs chapter 18, 24 says, a man of many companions comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother? Now, is it wrong to have a bunch of friends? No, no, it's not wrong. But what I want to encourage you to do today is to concentrate on quality, not quantity. To, to, to be more committed, because you, you, you can't be committed to everyone. You only can be committed to a few people. One real friend is worth more than a thousand acquaintances, you guys. One godly, spirit-filled friend will change your life. You don't need a lot of friends. You just need a few that love the Lord. Amen, somebody? It's not about how many, it's about how deep. And so, so if we're going to relearn friendship, then we need to learn what Jesus modeled and we need to learn healthy boundaries. Let me give you an analogy today, of an analogy of a home or your home even, to show you that there are some healthy boundaries that we should actually be creating in our, I call it from casual relationships 
to close. We all have casual relationships on stepping, you know, one step at a time onto the most intimate part of your life, close relationships. Let me give you the, the analogy, though, of your home, because there is the sidewalk. That's where your home begins. It's in the sidewalk. The sidewalk is the crowd's place. Some people in your life belong on the sidewalk. They're just passers-by. Some of your coworkers belong on the sidewalk, okay? Social media people, they belong on the sidewalk. They can see your life from a distance. And here's the reality. Some of us allow the opinions of people on the sidewalk to influence our life too much. These people who are not even, they're on the sidewalk. And so these are the passers-by. These are people in the crowd, okay? That's, that's a, but then there's this next step in, the, in a kind of a closer relationship. There's the porch, the porch. That's the available space. I mean, it used to be a space where we, we spent more time in, but sometimes, you know, someone will come and knock on your door, or ring your doorbell, and you open that door. Sometimes you step out on the porch with them, you have a conversation. It's the available space. You're making yourself available to this person because they, the, they move from the sidewalk to the porch. And at times, you may open the door and you may stand in the doorway because you're like, you ain't coming any further. This ain't, this conver- I'm, I'm going to control this conversation because this is going to Okay, check this out. Sometimes people ring your doorbell or knock on your door and you go, be quiet, everybody. <laughs> Who is that? Let me check my text message. Who did, did you invite somebody? Because this isn't the time. Like, this is my time with my kids. Or my, they're gonna, I'm not expecting. So sometimes you don't even open the door because someone who belongs on the sidewalk is trying to get to the porch. And I only have enough time and enough energy to go around and I'm not going to let you steal it because I'm here with my babies. Okay. So, so you got your sidewalk, you got, you got the porch, the available space, and then let's go a little bit further. You got your living room, which is the comfortable place where you're just a place of God. You can be real. You can be authentic. You can be you. You're comfortable. Now, look, the, the living room isn't that intimate. It doesn't need to be deep. You need to really just, you guys, this is normal, like to have relationships that at some place along the journey, it's okay to be here, to have comfortable relationship. You ain't being fake. You ain't being phony. It's just, it is what it is. I can be real. I can have a, like we have similar interests, whatever it is. I can have this kind of living room comfort level with this person, but there's another level even deeper into your home called the dining room. That's that shared place. Um, it's gone away in a lot of homes, that dinner table, right? I think we need to come back in a strong way where your family gets to, at the dinner table again. You share a meal. You look into the eyes of your kids and you say, how was your day? How's it going? You share your day. You share your experiences. This is the place where you share your lives. The people in this, play, in this space, in the dining room, they're comfortable going into your fridge, right? And grabbing a drink. They don't even need to ask. They go in there. That dude coming to your porch ain't going to your fridge. You know, there's a different level of intimacy here and connection. When you got a dining room, you're sharing your, your life with people at this space. But then there's another space. There's actually the most sacred place of your life that really only a few should ever get to. And that's the bedroom. That's the intimate place. Now, I'm not talking about your literal bedroom between you and your, your spouse, but if you are married, your spouse should be in the bedroom, okay? Because, and I want to make that distinction because some of you have a space like called the bedroom in your home, but you don't have the bedroom in your heart. So, so it's supposed to be a place where you share your dreams and your hopes and your fears, but you're so closed off, she don't get to see you cry. She don't get to see your hurts. You, know, you, you don't know how to move people from the porch to the home so you don't trust and you're not vulnerable and you're not meant to do life alone. You don't need a whole bunch of people in that space, but you do need some. In fact, like some of you, and some of you are the other extreme, some of you are letting people from the sidewalk into the bedroom. Do you know how you're doing that? Through social media. You, you, are, you are there in, in a literal bedroom and you're scroll, scrolling other people's business. And, and other people's business is dominating your thoughts in the most intimate, sacred space of your life. And not only is it dominating some of your thoughts, sometimes it's even dominating your conversation. Did you see? Have you seen? And then now, not only is it their business, you're up in that business. It's messing with your business now, and it's none of your business. None of it. Jesus, Jesus had healthy boundaries. You can love everybody. You can, you can be generous and willing to share you can be open and accessible. You can love everybody. But some people, listen to me, you need to be wise. You need to relearn friendship. Some people you need to love from the sidewalk. Some people you need to love at the porch. Some people you need to love in the, in the dining room. In the, 
Some people need to love and invite into the most sacred space of your life. I want to give you some biblical insight here to help us relearn how to be a friend according to the scriptures. Like, what does it look like? Let me say this, though, because when a relationship is struggling and, and, and maybe even fractured, sometimes, write this down, sometimes you need to reset the expectation, not enter rehabilitation. So I'm praying that you would get some insight today in, in, in some of your relationships that actually need to get reset the expectation, meaning the boundary. Some people are at, maybe they're in the dining room, but you need to put them back on the porch. Okay, you need to like shift around uh, and relearn and rethink how friendship is because you don't need to invite everybody into the most sacred space of your life. And I'm not saying hold a grudge and don't forgive. We have to do that to stay free. I am saying though, when someone shows you who they are, you got to believe them. Because there are some people, listen to me, some people you should not be friends with. Okay, and that might sound unchristian or unloving, and I'm, I promise you it's not. In fact, I, I was studying the Proverbs for this entire series and studied it, and, and, and there in the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, it's a wisdom book. There are four types of people that Solomon writes about that he says you should not be friends with. I, I actually, I'm gonna give you the four types of people he says most, in, they are the most repeated type of person. In the Proverbs, that you, are, you should not be friends with. Because we know, some of you know, bad company corrupts good manners. I get that. But there are some types of people you should not let into a sacred place of your life. Four types of people that the Bible says. Let's relearn it, man. Let's re relearn friendship and get back to the word of God. Number one is this. He says, don't be friends with people who like to argue. So if you notice someone who loves conflict, who's like energized by the drama, you better stay away from that person. That's not a healthy person to be friends with. Proverbs chapter 20, verse three, any fool can start an argument. The honorable thing is to stay out of them. You know what they try? Look, fools, fools try to look, look smart by, by pointing out the problem and by making problems. Wise people though, they know how to solve problems, not just spot them. There's a difference between being a problem spotter and a problem solver. All it takes is a critical spirit to be a problem spotter. Anyone can spot a problem. It takes wisdom to be a problem solver. Don't be friends. The Bible says don't be friends with people who like to argue. The second thing it says is don't be friends with people who like to gossip. There goes your friend list. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I remember this joke I was told a long time ago, man, of, a pastor, a rabbi, and a priest. Nothing, nothing good begins with that, by the way. No joke good, but let me, I'll try. A pastor, a rabbi, and a priest were in the same restaurant eating together. They noticed they were all alone eating together, so they all sat at the same table. They had such a good time kind of connecting with each other and just started getting open and sharing, and, and they have a lot of similarities. So the priest just spoke up and said, hey, guys, you know, there's something that we do in my tradition that I'd like to do I think would be beneficial for us, and I think I need it. I think you guys need it too. What, can, let's have confession. Let's just, because I'd like to share, and I think you guys sounds like need to share something, and I'll go first. I, can I confess to you guys? Something I've never shared with anyone, but I've got greed, and I've been battling greed for a long time, and it started small, and I didn't deal with it, and now it's really dominating my life. I'm just, I'm greedy. I'm running after the wrong things, and even just saying this, ooh, I feel better just saying this to you guys. And then, and then the rabbi was like, man, I'm so inspired by your vulnerability uh, can, can I share something with you guys? I've never shared any of this before with anyone, but I struggle with lust. And, 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 and I try to deal with it before, and sometimes I'm good, and sometimes, like, like I've never shared this with anybody, but even just saying this, whew, I just feel like, man, it's just lost some power in my life. Thank you guys for being this, this moment. And then the pastor goes, wow, you guys are so inspiring. Can I share it to you? I got a problem with gossip. In fact, I'm late for another party. I'll see you guys later. No. <laughs> did, you know, did you know that God hates gossiping, the Bible says? Do you know God hates some things? There's actually some things that God says are detestable to him. It says it's detrimental. He says the gossiper is friend to the saboteur. They sabotage relationships. Gossip sabotage ministries. They sabotage families. They sabotage churches and teams. Gossips are destructive, and the Bible judges that sin very, very harshly, and it says don't even be a friend to someone. Proverbs 20, verse 19, stay away from gossips. They can't keep a secret. They tell everything. 
You got to be careful. Some of you, because you, some of you are like, I don't gossip. I'm just, I'm, people just like to tell me things, Pastor. I just, I'm just that kind of person. You got to be careful. Gossip, by the way, isn't just what you're, what you're saying. It's what you're listening to. You're a gossip just by listening to you. You got to be careful of listening to the perspective of hurt people, listening to the perspective of haters, because you think you're, you're fine. It discolors your perspective. You start looking at someone through the lens of somebody else's hurt and somebody else's hate when they've never done nothing to you, okay? Your gossip will find you out. You think your gossip is in secret, but I promise you, you, you will be known eventually. Your friends will know that you are the gossip. Do yourself a favor and do not be friends. The Bible says, don't be friends with a gossip. It also says this, don't be friends with people who flatter others. Do you know that? People who use flattery. No, 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 don't be friends with people. Flattery is false praise. It's, it's insincere compliments. Flattery is the person who kisses up to their boss in front of them, but then talks about them to the coworkers behind his back. That's, that's flattery. Proverbs 29 verse 5 says, flattery is a trap. Evil people get caught in it, but good people avoid it and are free. Often people will compliment me about the, the sermon here just like, I don't know, a month or so ago. Someone complimented me about the message. They said, Pastor Jason, that was the best message I heard in my life. You spoke to me. And I'm like, and I say often what I, what I do say, I'll, you know, we, we'll talk about it. I'll say, I'm so glad God spoke to you. It's one of the things I'm just, and, and she goes, she goes, no, 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 wait. No, you spoke to me. I know God used you, but Pastor, you, you spoke to me. You did good. And I just got a check in my spirit, like, not today, Satan. No, 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 no. <laughs> Listen to me. Who gets the credit and the glory determines if you're going to get crushed by it or not. Because you know the word glory means? Glory means weight. You can't handle the weight of glory. You got you to you give the credit. Now, I'm not saying false humility or anything. I'm like, oh, you just, no, it's not me. It's not me. No, I understand. Like, I'm, God's using me. I get that. But he's the one who gets the glory. He's the one who, because if it was good, he spoke to you. I promise you, if, if it was me, it's, it, I don't deserve the credit. Everything good in me, he gets. Amen? Amen? Some people, though, they'll flatter you because they actually hate you. I pray that God is just giving you wisdom here. Flattery is often disguised hatred, and they'll say one thing to your face, but they say another thing to your back. I mean, you know some people like that or experiences like that. Proverbs 64, verse 2, David said, they're friendly to my face, but they curse me in their heart, and they delight in telling lies about me. There are entire reality shows about this verse right here, you guys. Come on. Don't be friends with them. Here's the last thing. That, that in Proverbs, there's just some people that you should be careful not to be friends with. The fourth one is don't be friends with people who can't control their temper. People who, so, so you could be two different, you know, ways of expressing rage. You could, you could be the martyr or the manic. You could be what I call the skunk or the turtle. Some of you guys are the turtle. You retreat into the shell and you're like, oh, poor me. Like, everyone hates me. And you isolate yourself. And then some of you are like the skunk, man. And you just stink everybody up. You're like, I don't care where we're at. You could be in the restaurant. You're like, no, I don't care. I'm mad. And you're going to know it. Okay, skunks are like, they're hot-headed, they're short-fused, they're volatile, they're rash, they're, they blow up quickly, they're easily upset. Proverbs 22, verse 24, 25 says, don't make friends with hot-tempered people. Don't associate with anyone easily angered. They get ticked off at everything, right? You gotta walk on eggshells around that person. Don't, that's not a good friend. Why? Because you're gonna learn to be like them and you're not gonna be able to change that. So it says anger is contagious. Like a lot of emotions, you know it's contagious. And loneliness is contagious. You can catch that. You can catch that spirit. Depression is contagious. You can catch that. Anger is contagious. You, you'll catch it. And he says, man, you won't be able to change because the people you hang out with, that's what you're going to become like. Proverbs 27, 19 says, as a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. See, the type of friend you are is the type of friend you will attract. So either you're a bad judge of character or you're attracted to dysfunction or you're a bad friend yourself and you're just attracting who you are. We gotta relearn. We gotta relearn some things. So I think we practice the model of culture too much and let culture influence how we actually do friendship. So, so what does it mean though to be a friend? What does it mean to be a friend according to the word of God? If this is gonna be our standard, you guys, what does it mean? What does a friend look like? I'm going to give you, in my, there's, there's probably a, a lot more here, but I'm going to give you the six core practices 
of, of, of friendship according to the Bible. There are six things, if this is going to be my source, the Word of God, there are six core practices that I need in my life if I'm going to be the friend that God has called me to be. Romans chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, hey, when we get together, here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. This is such a great definition of friendship right here, because it doesn't matter what personality you have or hobbies you have or interests you have, but man, if I get around you and I can encourage your faith and you can encourage my faith, man, that's a friendship. That's someone who, who I can get close to. It's so important that you get into vibrant, authentic, real, life-changing relationships. And I'll add, in a small group at Discovery. Amen, somebody? I intentionally wanted to speak about this first because small groups are launching today at Discovery. There's over like 160 of them. You can scan this QR code on the screen right now. Find a group that's right for you, especially if you're here and you're on the journey of freedom with us. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to work some things out this year. So a lot of you are treating groups and, and these meaningful connections like it's optional. Can I tell you something? This is not optional. This is critical. It's critical for your freedom. It's critical for your healing. Get connected to a small group. But the only way to have a true friend is to be a true friend. So what does that look like? What are the six core practices? According to the word of God, the six core practices of a friend. Okay, here they are. Number one. A friend, what it looks like in the Word of God, you share the good stuff. You share the good stuff. And, and why, is it, why is it so important? We live in a culture where bad news not only travels faster than good news, it often is the only thing that's out there is bad news. And sometimes I think we can get into this mindset that I only share when it's hard. I only share when it's bad. And you're not depositing any good seed in the soil of your relationship and your friendship. And it's always trauma and it's always bad. But you need to share the good stuff. That's what a friend looks like. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Now, if I don't tell the, this is what I tell the leaders at Discovery. I, I, when I teach the leaders at Discovery, I tell them, if, if you don't tell the right stories, the wrong stories will take its place. So if we're not telling stories of life change and what God is doing and, and, and what God is doing in families or in outreach or in mission or in the baptism, if we're not telling those stories and actively rejoicing and telling the good stuff, the bad stuff's going to take it place. You're just going to hear gossip and criticism, negativity. How come and why not? Blah, blah, blah. It's going to it's it's consume it. So you got to intentionally share the good stuff. Here's what's important about sharing the good stuff. If people can't be happy for you with your good stuff, then they shouldn't be trusted with your bad stuff. See, some people are happier when you're going through trials and testing than they are when you're experiencing God's blessing. So I'm gonna share the good stuff in my relationship. I'm gonna deposit seeds of rejoicing. We're gonna talk about the goodness of God. But the rest of that verse in Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice, but weep with those who weep. So I don't just share the good stuff. Number two, I gotta share the bad stuff too. That's what a friend looks like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to somebody about it when I'm going through it. I'm gonna share it. You had a bad day, you share it with a friend. You cussed out your spouse on the way here, you share it. Not everybody, don't tell everybody that, man. Just a few, just those few that are in the air, okay? Sometimes adversity, though, really reveals who your brothers and sisters are. Because your brothers are the people who will show up. They'll walk in when everyone else is walking out. Okay, when everyone else is taking a step back because you're going through a bad season, you're going through a bad breakup, you're going through a bad time, a bad whatever, other people are stepping out. The real friends are the ones who are stepping in in that moment. They're stepping in and, and because they're helping you carry what you're going through. That's what a good friend does. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And we read that verse and we see that God's law, God's law, by the way, is his standard of love. It's love each other. So God's law, his standard of love is fulfilled in carrying the burden. But many people overlook the reality that I cannot fulfill the revelation of God's law in Christ if we're not sharing the burden in the first place. Because we're too fixated on the possibility of being rejected that no one can fulfill the law of Christ and love you by helping you carry that burden. Because you're just sharing the good stuff. No one knows the bad stuff that's happening. And while you might be able to impress people with your strengths, you connect with people through your weaknesses. And this is where friendships are made, when you share the bad stuff. Second Corinthians chapter 1 says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all our troubles. Aren't you glad that when you're going through a bad season, bad day, bad time, it's bad, man. You can go directly to the throne room of God, to the God of all comfort. He can comfort you right where you at. Yes, God wants you to go to your brother, your sister, but aren't you glad that you can step right in, you can receive the comfort of your father. Here's why though, look what it says. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that God actually gave us. So when you're sharing the bad stuff, here's what it is. When you're sharing that bad stuff that you experience, sometimes it's the hope somebody else needs that they can get through it too. Sometimes you'll share that bad stuff. Someone says, oh, you know what? I've been there too. Shoot, I just cussed out my wife too. No, I'm just kidding. I just, I just beat, I just, oh man, you too? You too? You get, you get comfort? No, I didn't. Stop. Some of y'all looking at me. I didn't. Okay, y'all looking crazy at me? Not today. The bad stuff. This is what a friend looks like. You share the good stuff. You share the bad stuff. And then let's, number three is a little bit harder though. If you want to be a friend according to the word of God, you share the dark stuff. So whether you go to church or not, or you're a Christian or not in here today, the dark stuff is the stuff you'd love to see in your life gone. It's, it, you'd love to see it change. It's the dark stuff are the things in your life that you're desperately trying to keep hidden. You're trying to keep in the dark. You're trying to mask over and pretend like it's not there, and I hope no one ever finds that out. Second Corinthians chapter four, Paul says, we refuse to wear masks. And I hope that's your declaration today. I hope I, I can get you to a place where you're like, I refuse this. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scene and try to project something we're not. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. There's this real fear of living like that though, right? Of, of taking that mask off. It's, it's, the, it's a fear of exposure that people are gonna see. And then, and then if they do see, I'm not gonna get help. I'm not gonna get mercy. I'm not gonna get comfort. Dude, people, people know this. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm gonna get fired. Like, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get help. I'm not gonna get support, man. I'm gonna get divorced if. I'm gonna lose respect of some people that I actually enjoy in my life if, if this came out. And so I wanna just give you some hope today to let you know that God doesn't want to expose you. He's not here pointing an accusing finger at you. We all have sin. He knows we have sin. And that's why he loved us so much to send us, not someone who's gonna be a judge and a gavel and slamming it down in our life, but instead he sent his son on a rescue plan to set you free. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. First John 1 says it like this. So we're lying. If we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living with this in spiritual darkness, I'm, I'm just, I'm living a lie, hiding this. We're not, he says, practicing the truth. Come on, we just came out of freedom. What sets you free? It's the truth that sets you free. But if we're, he says, living in the light, as God's in, because that's where God is, God's in that light, then I have fellowship with my brothers and my sisters. I got fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here's what John is saying. As long as that dark stuff remains in the dark, the devil has his hand on your life. That's his playground. The dark is where he lives. That's where the strong grip of the enemy is on your life. And you think, this is a lie of the enemy. See, the devil's lying to you to keep it hidden, to keep it there, because you think by bringing it in the light, you are, it's gonna be worse. He wants it to stay in the dark. When you bring it to the light, it says, God's there, God's there. And you're gonna be cleansed and you're gonna be purified. Not only that, he says, now I can have fellowship. I can like, I can truly connect meaningfully without that burden of the dark stuff weighing on me. When we first started Discovery, I was like the, the janitor, the receptionist, the secretary, the pastor, the counselor, the everything, man. And we had this phone number, it's the same phone number we have, but I had it mapped on my phone. We used to have a clip back in the day, the clip. Remember the clip? It used to be cool. Maybe not, it wasn't cool back then either. But anyway, I like, it's the same phone number, 368-1477. It would come right to me. And I'm like, I was like desperate for people to call. I had it mapped to my phone and I'm like, you can see it's coming from Discovery. I'm like, yes, someone's calling Discovery Church. And, and one time someone called, I picked up, and thank you for calling Discovery Church. How can I help you? And there's this lady on the other end, and she's asked, she asks, do you do counseling services there? I'm like, absolutely, we do counseling services there. Yeah, yeah, it's me, right? It's me. You know, come, yes, we do. And, and, and I said, so have you been visiting Discovery? 
Uh, and, and she said, oh, no, no, I attend another church. And I said, you, you attend another? Well, how come, how come you're not getting counseling there? And she goes, oh, no. They can't know what I'm going through. I said, let me give you some counseling right now. Because <laughs> actually, they're, they're the people who God has ordained to know the stuff that you're trying to keep hitting. And I encouraged her to, and hopefully she did, um, encourage her to go to her, her people, her, her group, her her pastors and share, because you don't need to share, don't, don't post the dark stuff, don't share with everybody, but you do need to have some people that God has put in your life that know the good stuff, the bad stuff, the dark stuff. This is what a friend looks like, according to the Bible. Number four is, is you share experiences. You share experiences. This is actually how friendships are developed, is through taking advantage of some shared experiences. The reason why you're friends with most of your friends, statistically, you're, you're friends with them because you shared stuff. You're, some of you are still friends with people that you shared a, a team with. You were, they were on the team. They were on your baseball team or your football team or, or they, you were in the military together and that's something you experienced together. You experienced war. I experienced war with some people. We still catch up. I never see them, but they're in my life and I'm, I'm friends with them. So there's some shared experiences that we have. Like some of you guys, your best friends are your coworkers just because it's the shared experience. We work together, but you didn't choose that. Someone else hired them. That's a circumstantial, you know what I mean? This, it's just my circumstance, and they're closest to you because of shared experience. Proverbs 8, 24 says, there are friends who pretend to be friends, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So if you really want to develop meaningful friendships, you need, you need to get into some shared experiences, not circumstantial experiences, but shared. And here at Discovery, we have, we have some shared experiences. If you want to develop meaningful relationship with, a, with your church family, there's, there's a few things that I think you should do. I think you should start sharing experiences. First three, real quick. Um, just decide, I'm going to be at church. I'm going to come to church. If, church, if, I, if I'm in town, I'm, I'm here. If I, actually, if I'm out of town, I'm going to church somewhere else. That's what I do. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be in the house of God. Number two, I'm going to belong to a group. Number three, I'm going to serve on a team. If you just did those three things, you would put yourself in a shared experience with a community of faith. You'd start developing some more relationships, some meaningful connections with people if you made those three commitments. And there's other shared experiences that we have here at Discovery, like Women's Night is coming up later this month. You women should be a part, you should be in the room sharing the experience of what the Word of God and the impartation of God, you should be there to receive that with the other ladies and, and experience that, share that together, and it's going to do something to your relationships. Men's Night is next month. You men need to be in the room. I know it's easier to be out of the room, being in the room and share the experience of the word of God and the presence of God so that experience can form relationships. It's through shared experience. Acts chapter two, it says of the early church that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they had a, a large church that had thousands of people. The apostles would teach the thousands of people, but they weren't just committed to the crowd. They said to fellowship and to breaking of bread and prayer. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad in sincere hearts. So yeah, no, I can't just exist in the crowd. I got to get to, I got to get some, some of these shared experiences. If you want to be the friend that the Bible, the picture the Bible is painting for us, okay? Number five, a friend shares the truth. A friend shares the truth. A true friend will never get in your way unless they're going the wrong direction. A true friend will step in your way then. This is an excuse to be a jerk. You're like, I'm just being honest. I'm gonna tell you the truth. No, this is an excuse to be a jerk. Proverbs 24, 26 says, an honest answer is a sign of true friendship. Because a true friend will level with you. They're going to shoot straight with you. They're going to tell you the truth even when it hurts. And we all have blind spots, you guys. This is why we need people like this in our life, people that are truth tellers in our life. Because some of you don't have anybody. You don't have truth tellers in your life. You've surrounded yourself with people who don't give you. They just tell you what you want to hear. And, and, and if you're in a vehicle, you're going <laughs> You got blind spots and you don't consider the blind spots, you're getting in an accident. You're headed for a wreck. Your, your, your life is limited. Your marriage is limited. Your potential is limited because you got no, no, no friend like this in your life that can tell you the truth. Proverbs 27 says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Hey, hurt me. You're my friend. You can hurt, you can tell me something that I don't, that doesn't make me feel good. It hurts my feelings a little bit because I know you love me and you have my best interests. Okay, but let me, as it comes to truth, let me give you some extra notes here, some rules for being candid, because it's not just truth, it's truth in love. So let me give you some rules 
for your truth telling, for being candid, four of them for you. Number one, compliment in public and correct in private. This is just a good rule, man. Don't correct somebody in front of their kids, their wife, their friends, their coworkers. No, no, no. Compliment them in public and correct them in private. Number two, correct when they're up, not when they're down. When they're feeling the weight of that mistake, the pain of it, when they're being pressured, that's not the time for you to pile it on and correct them. That's the time for you to show up and carry a burden with them. So when they're on the other side of that, that's when you can actually speak some correction. Number three, never correct until you've proven you're open to correction yourself. So don't step into somebody's life and correct them. If you haven't demonstrated, they can actually step into your life and correct you and you respond well to it, okay? Number four, don't share your opinion Share the truth. I don't want to. I don't want to know. I don't want to. Your opinion don't listen. I don't want to know what your grandma did. I don't know what mama told you. I don't want to know what your tradition. A real friend, according to the Word of God, is going to share the truth. Jesus said in John seventeen seventeen, He said, "Let them know your word, God. Teach them your word, because your word is truth." That's what a real friend does. A real friend is going to share the truth of not just their tradition and their opinion, and no, they're going to share the truth of the Word of God. Look, this is what friendship looks like. And we need to relearn this thing because some of us have been influenced by our culture too much. We've got to relearn it because after all that, listen to me, after all that, sharing the good and the bad and the dark experiences, truth, some truth that hurts even. Here's what a real friend does. Number six, after all that, they love you anyway. They love you anyway. And, and you can say that for you personally too. After all that that you receive from them, you love them anyway. That's what our, Proverbs chapter 17, 17 tells us. A friend loves at all times. That's what it looks like to be a friend. It covers. Job was a guy who had it all. Remember Job? He had it all. and He thought he had a whole bunch of friends. But then when the wheels started falling off, he discovered his friends really weren't the friends he thought he, they were. Job said in Job chapter 6, verse 14, he said, a despairing man, a man who's going through it, someone who's, who's like in despair, struggling. I'm, I'm in a bad season. I'm in a bad way, man. I'm in a dark time. A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends, even if he's forsaking the Almighty in that moment. Real friends should show up and say, this ain't gonna take you out. Hey, get up off that floor. That's not the truth. That's a lie of the enemy. Come on, man. You know who you are. You know who God is. A real friend will love at all times. Romans 15, 7, it tells us to accept each other just as Christ accepted you. See, I think the reason why it's hard for us to be this kind of friend that the Bible tells us, it paints the picture of friendship, it's hard for us to be this kind of friend because we've never experienced this kind of friend. And I want you to know something about Jesus. He sees your good, he sees your bad, he sees your dark, and he loves you anyway. Some of you may even try to, you may think you're keeping it hidden, you're keeping stuff in the dark. And some of you, it, this is what's prevented you of stepping in or maybe inviting Jesus into the most sacred space of your life, like that bedroom space, that, that space of your pain, your hurt, your tears, your fears, like that space. This has, that stuff, you, it's been preventing you from inviting him in as if he didn't know it already. And you need to know he knows it and he loves you anyway. And he accepts you anyway. No, I'm not saying he accepts that, he accepts you. He's, he's, he's not going to reject you. When you come with that, he's not going to go, oh, mm, mm, oh. No, go, go, go do some counseling and come back and fix that. And then, no, no, no. There is this old hymn that we used to sing in church. It, it goes like this. And I'm not, I'm going to murder it, but y'all need to do it with me because y'all know it. Some of y'all know it. What a friend we have. Us, right? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The reason I think why a lot of us just haven't experienced this friendship in Jesus is we haven't carried it to Him. And you, you're, you're, you're letting it stay in the dark. And today, I'd love for you to experience the friendship of Jesus. I'd love to help, maybe help you invite him into this most sacred place of your life because he's not going to reject you. He's not going to judge you. 
He's going to save you. He's going to set you free. When you bring it into the light, you get mercy, grace. You get, you get cleansed. And only then and only then can you actually now have fellowship, connect with others the way that you were intended to. Can I pray that over you? Come on, with every head bowed, every eye closed, wherever you're at today, I, 